Pleasant good morning. My name is Leon Philbert. I'm the evangelist for the Church of Christ that meets at the corner of Canby Number no. 2 and Mount Pleasant Main Road. And I want to thank you for viewing Choosing Christ broadcasts. This program was designed with you in mind to inform, to edify, to strengthen, and to build you up in the word of the Lord. So I invite you to join with me as we examine God's word. Today's lesson is entitled, A Call to Fellowship with Him. I'm continuing on the series, Discipleship Applied. And I believe that this particular series of studies is important. And I would like to apply the lesson to what we are experiencing in, in this time as a people. I'd like to make an application to the crime that we're experiencing. I would like to make an application. Discipleship applied. We saw that the call of Jesus to discipleship in a previous lesson was a call to know him. This lesson is a call to fellowship with him. And I'm saying that first thing, we have to understand what it means to fellowship. All right. The word, the Greek word, koinonio, means a number of things. All right. It means to participate in. It means to share or to contribute. All right. Koinonio is a common union. Um, it's a, it's, it has reference to the conversation. All right. We fellowship in so many ways that we are not aware that we are fellowshipping in. When we have conversation, we are fellowshipping. When we participate in some benevolence need, we contribute or we, or, or we, we are sharing or giving. All right. That's koinonia, that's fellowship. Of course, in, this, in, this, in the scriptures, in the New Testament, um, Christian fellowship uh, is as a result of what Christ did for us. We first have fellowship with him, and then we have fellowship with each other. All right. So it is, first of all, fellowship with God, and then fellowship with each other. We read about in, in Acts chapter 2. And about verse 42, you know, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in breaking of bread, in prayers, and in fellowship. All right. Fellowship was a daily thing that the early Christian practiced and participated in. So, a call to fellowship with him. We understand what the word fellowship means, partnership, um, the outcome of fellowship, a contribution, all of those things. Now, we want to look at this call is an invitation to partake in his human suffering. Right. As Christians, we are called to participate in Jesus' human suffering. And what I, what I mean by this is that Jesus gave up his, of his glory, of his eternity in heaven, of, of his godliness. All right. And he, the Bible says he humbled himself and he took upon him the form or the fashion of a man. And he was found in the fashion of a man. That's Philippians 2 and verse 7. So, Jesus came. He came down. He came down where we are. So that he can be like us. He can understand us. And we can appreciate him. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says, concerning godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. He was 
justified in the spirit. You are seen by of angels. And the point that I want to make is that the one that says God was manifested in the flesh is referring to Jesus. All right. He came in the flesh so that he can understand what we are going through. Then, of course, Romans chapter 8 and verse 3 tells us what the law was unable to do in that it was weak in the flesh. God having sent his only begotten son in the form of sinful men and for sin he condemned sin. So this is another passage, Romans 8 and verse 3, that tells us that Jesus Christ came in the form of mankind. He came as a man. Having come in the form of a man, he then was subject to the things of humanity. We understand that he cried, he wept, he was tortured, he suffered. And as we examine the scriptures, the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 24 and verses 46 concerning the prophecies. The prophecies prophesied that Christ would suffer, uh, that he would be put to death, and that he would be raised on the third day. And numerous scriptures that talks about Christ's suffering. Right. The ultimate was that he went to the cross. Right. He went to the cross for our sins. He was ill-treated. He was spat upon. He was slapped. I mean, he was humiliated. All right. First Peter chapter 2 will tell us something about his suffering. When he was mistreated, he didn't retaliate. All right. But he bore it all for us. All right. And this lesson is telling us that we have been called to fellowship with him. Fellowship in not only the good things that happen, but also in the bad things, the suffering as Christians. And so we need to look at some passages that will explain the suffering that we must participate in in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. Just wanna he says, uh, If ears then joint ears of God, joint ears with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So, Paul, in writing to the Roman Christian, he's saying that it's only when we suffer with Christ can we benefit, can we participate in the glory. In the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12 says, If we endure... We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And if I can back, back up to verse 11, this is a faithful saying. For if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And so, 
As Christians, we are called to suffer. First Timothy chapter, First Peter chapter four and verse thirteen tells us, and I'm reading from the New King James version. But rejoice, this is Peter writing to the Christians here. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. This is Christians. Now I want to, I want to tie in this a bit to what is happening. Because you see, when we think about the crime that is taking place in our land, and the fact that, you know, persons are bent on doing the wrong, they have, their minds are uh, transformed to that way of life. And we somehow believe that we can do something, a quick fix, we can get a quick fix. I tend to want to disagree. There's no quick fix to the criminal mind. But I want to suggest to you that when you think about Christianity, Christianity deals with the mind, conversion of the mind, a changing of the mind. When a person is converted to Christ, in other words, he's now thinking like Christ, let this mind be in you which also is in Christ Jesus. He's acting like Christ. All right. And so, it is one thing to have followers. All right. It's another thing to have disciples. The crowd followed Jesus. They followed Jesus for different reasons. And he had to turn and tell them, the, one of the reasons that some of them were following is for the belly. Because he was able to multiply the food, the fish, and the bread. But when we as Christians or disciples take our commitment serious and we work on ourselves and we are the transformed ones, it's only then that we have the power to transform others. Because, as the poet, the, poet, the, the poet said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. All right. The words that are spoken may ru rush along the way. Mm -hmm. All right. People are looking for examples. All right. And the very guys on the streets know about the lifestyle of persons who are professing Christ Christianity. Right. And, and in their mind, they may be saying, well, if you are serving Christ, if you are going to church regularly, and you are not changed, what's the point in I coming there? Right. They want to see the transformation in us. We will only make a difference when there is a difference in our lives, All right. in our homes. You know, um, our greatest challenge is convincing those that live with us who are not Christians. Because they see us every day. They know what, uh, what we are all about. And so, as I talk about suffering uh, with Christ, I'm saying that it's only at that point can persons really consider us as an example. You, you're going through all of this? All right. You're allowing this? You know, and the Bible talks about, you know, in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, if we suffer as a Christian. Verse 12 says, Beloved, don't, do not... Think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you 
Right? As though some strange things happen to you, but rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also be partakers of his exceeding joy. All right. Verse 16 says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. So I'm saying that it's only when the person in the world, the young man or the young woman, who is going to go through hardship, because the Bible says all that will live godly will suffer persecution. But everybody in this life, at some point in time, is going to have to go through hardship. All right. How you deal with it, how you cope with it, is, is what makes the difference. So when a person can see that you are going through hardship, but you are not sad, you're not bitter, you're not angry, you are rejoicing, you want to know how it is you can do that. How it is that, that you know, in, in times of, of, of hardship, in times of pressure, you might have lost a job or sickness in the family, a debt in the family, and you're able to go through it in a certain way, people take note of that. They want to know what it is about you that you can go through life accepting the challenges dealing with the challenges that is common to life. Right. And they may maybe desire, desire your, that, that what you have. So a call to participate in his suffering. And it also have, we are also going to participate in his glory. Not only in his suffering, but in his glory. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, come unto me. Um, no, he said, um, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. All right. So his purpose for coming was that we will have life. And have life through his name. In the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5, and verse 21, it says, So that as sin reigned to death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's an invitation to participate in his eternal life. In chapter 6 of Romans and verse 22, it says, But now having been set free from sin and having become slave to, to God, you have your fruits to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we, we are promised eternal life. God is, is inviting us to participate in Christ, in the life of Christ. Titus. Chapter 1 and verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time begun. In hope of eternal life, which God promised. God cannot lie. And if he promises eternal life, he will deliver on his promise. But we must qualify ourselves. And I'll explain that in a short while. Again, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. 
Paul writing to, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Life is promised no, no other place but in Christ Jesus. So we have this promise of life and it's only in Christ Jesus. Nobody wants to die when you're really examining it. Those who take life doesn't want their life to be taken. So, this special invitation, we find that in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, we read at chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, there is a place where all spiritual blessings are, and that's in Christ Jesus. We read, verse 20 tells us, same Ephesians 1, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and dominions and might. The heavenly places, the heavenly realms. All right. And so it's important that we understand something about this heavenly realms. In chapter 3 of Ephesians and verse 10, Ephesians 3 and verse 10, for it says, For we are his workmanship, created where? In Christ Jesus, before, in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right. So, we want to understand all right, that the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places are in Christ. Christ has translated us into the heavenly places. We are in Christ. And once we are in Christ, we are in the heavenly places. I want to show you in the book of John, 1 John chapter 3, and verse, verses 14 and 15, that the Christian have no need to be afraid of what is happening around them. They have no need to be in fear, but rather they need to extend themselves and let the man in the world know that he can have this confidence. I mean, perfect love casted away all fear. All right. This love is only found in Christ Jesus. So hear what John tells his writer. 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And I'll pick it up from verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I want you to take some time out and, and, and see that the passage tells us that we have passed from death unto life. Um, quickly, I want to go to chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 11, from verse 11, it says, And this is the testimony that God has given, to, he had given us eternal life. And this 
life is in his son, Jesus. So we have life, we have eternal life. That eternal life is in Christ Jesus. And so if we know these things and we are assured of these things, then our fellowship it's truly, he says in, in, in chapter 1 of 1 John, it's truly with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. God is, is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Christians are called to fellowship with Jesus. This fellowship includes His suffering as well as His glory. But as we apply this fellowship, I want you to know that the things that are confronting us as a people, as a society, what we really need is true disciples. What, what, what is needed is persons whose life have been transformed and who are in a position to help others to transform their lives. No quick fix. And it's only when a person's life is transformed and it begins with the mind. Right. It begins with the mind. It begins with teaching. That's why we, in, in the Christian faith, we believe in teaching others. Right. Anything else, you know, there are things that we will do on our own initiative. But then there is that which God has designed for us to do, which Jeff called us to do. He called us to preach the word. To be in, in instant, in season, out of season. All right. There is nothing that can take the place of, of preaching the word. The gospel is still God's sa power unto salvation to everyone. Nothing can replace prayers. Prayers is simply us calling upon, talking to our Heavenly Father. All right. There may be people in this world who don't believe in prayers, but it doesn't change the fact that Prayers is one of the most powerful things that we have. And so as I bring this lesson to a close, right, I want to say that everybody has their, their, their role and their part to do in society when it comes to crime. The church needs to understand that our part is in preaching the word. Our part is in changing the minds of sinful men. That's not an easy role. That's not a quick fix. Because there are some who would not change, who would not even listen to Jesus. We're not saying that because we, we have the, the, the gospel and the word, everybody's going to respond to it. No, not everybody's going to respond. But there are those who would respond and who would change their life. And that's who we are called. We are called to go to all, to teach all, and to help try to help all. But we know that is only some that are going to be saved. I want to thank you for this time that we have spent together. I trust that you know some of it would be meaningful to you. You understand that the life of Christ is what is important in our society today and that we can work together to do a number of things but understand our main mission is in the preaching and the teaching of the word. I thank you until next time. God bless.